significant event with his closest followers, his disciples. They were in a room. It was not a large room. It was a very intimate space where they were talking about serious things. And Jesus was giving them a glimpse of what was about to happen. And it was in this very small group within this very uh, serious conversation that he looks at the 12 and he says, one of you are, is going to, <clears throat> amen, is going to betray me. And then they begin to argue am amongst themselves and one of them says uh, to the one of the other, I, I think it's you. I know in one place it says, is it I? But I just know people. I think it's you that's going to betray the Lord. No, not me. And, and in that, that conversation, in that, that the one of them says, well, uh, you may betray him, but I'm going to be at his right hand. And they began to argue about who was going to betray the Lord and who was going to be most prominent in the coming kingdom. And it was in this argument, I believe that the loudest voice was Peter. Peter was letting them know where he was going to be and what he was going to be doing. And I could just hear him being very uh, uh, bold about his uh, uh, belief of where and how important and how strong his commitment is to the Lord. And the Lord looks at Peter and says, Simon, Simon. Now, wait a minute. We know that the Lord had already changed the name of Simon. For it was just a few uh, days before that the Lord looked at Simon and said, Simon, thou shalt be called Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. But we see illustrated here as uh, throughout the scripture that, that all of us have a strength and we all have a weakness. We are all Simon Peter. Simon speaks of a, a reed, something that is easily bent, something that does not have strength, and yet his name given to him by God, Peter, is a rock. And so we see within the individual of Peter, he's Simon Peter. And even in this discussion, the Lord refers to him as Simon. And then just a few moments later, he refers to him as Peter. Simon, Peter. How many of you will raise your hand and say, I have some strengths that I thank God for? And how many of you with the other hand say, I have some weaknesses. I don't know why I have them. I wish I was delivered from, we're all, we're all Simon Peter. We all have weakness and strength. And, and, and the Lord spoke to the weakness of Peter, the, the frailty of Peter, the carnality of Peter. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, the, the, the Satan hath desired thee to sift thee as wheat. And, and Peter, as he would, was, was prone to do, he said, Oh, Lord, I'm willing to go to prison. I'm willing to die for you. And, and the Lord just kind of put him in his place said, Simon, the rooster is not going to crow on this day before you have told three times that I don't know who Jesus is. I don't even think Peter believed that. Because the truth of the matter is we think we know ourselves. But truly, if there's anybody that we lie to and deceive the most is ourselves. The scripture says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Sometimes we don't know how we'll act under a situation. You don't know what you would do if you were going through what your brother was going through. You don't know how you would act if you were going through what your sister was going through. So, so be careful what kind of judgment you pass out. Because if, if the way things go, sometimes when you're hard on someone for what they're going through, you be careful. One day you're going to find yourself in that same situation. And you better pray somebody's more merciful to you than you you were to them Simon Peter so the Lord told uh, Simon the, 
devil desires to sift thee as wheat. I think it's interesting that in this setting, the Lord and his disciples are, are taking, they're observing the Passover. The Passover is one of the first Jewish religious observances that, that they had as a people. The first was circumcision. We understand that because of the covenant Abraham had with the Lord, that from Abraham until the day of Egypt, they were circumcising their children. It was a way of covenant to say we are not a Gentile. And so it was, I would say, the second religious observance that was instituted while they were in Egypt. And I, I think it's interesting to consider, everybody say sifting. The Lord had a, 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 an occasion to speak to Abraham. The Bible says the Lord gave Abraham a sacrifice to make. And, and, the, and he did just exactly what the Lord told him to do. And the Bible says that a burning lamp, as it were, passed through the sacrifice. And a great darkness came upon Abraham. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Your seed will sojourn in another land. And things won't go well with them. But when they come out, they will come out with great wealth. The Lord prepared Abraham that there was a sifting coming his way. And we know that jo Joseph went down to Egypt and Joseph was the, the, the tool in which the Lord used to save not just his family, but Joseph was used to save the world through his uh, God gifting and his wisdom given by God. And God gave him favor in that he was the most powerful, respected, honored individual in all of Egypt except for Pharaoh. And when his family come, here is a man that has saved Egypt. A man, uh, they just saved Egypt and made Egypt wealthy and made Egypt honored. And Egypt became the, the storehouse for the world. And, and Egypt was gloried in what Joseph did for them. And so he was a highly favored man. And so when Joseph brought his father and his brothers, and he said, this is my family, they were honored in Egypt, and they gave him a special place to be. They put him in a place called Goshen. But the Bible says a day came when a Pharaoh rose to the scene who didn't know about Joseph. He didn't know about Joseph's people. He didn't know about Jacob. He didn't know about Abraham. But all he knew about the Jews is they are not us. They are different than us. They live over there uh, in Goshen, and, 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 and there's something different about them, and they are blessed. They're multiplying, and, and they're growing greater. And if we're not careful, they're going to be greater than us. So we need to subjugate them, and they, they, they put them in bondage, and they, they put them in slavery, and, and they cause them to work with great uh, turmoil. Everybody say Passover. And the Lord, the Bible says that the Lord went to Moses after 400 years. Everybody say 400 years. You've been going through a hard time in four days, and you're like, oh, God, help me. You go through, through a hard time for four weeks, and you're like, oh, God, help me. Amen. These people have been going through hard times for 400 years. It wasn't just them. It wasn't just their daddy. It just wasn't their grandpa. But they had been going through a hard time for 10 generations. Everybody say, hard time. And the Bible says that the Lord heard the cry of the people of Israel, and he talked to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to go down to Egypt. It's time for those people to come out. I told their grandpa, Abraham, that they were going to go through some sifting, but their sifting season is over, and they're going to come out. And so Moses went down to Egypt and the Lord used him in a mighty way and through him there was one plague and two plagues and three plagues and four plagues and five plagues and six plagues and seven plagues and eight plagues and nine plagues and it right before the tenth. You know, when the plagues came to Egypt, they didn't come to Goshen. 
There was light in Goshen when gross darkness covered Egypt. Everybody say, I, I don't want you to have to repeat this, but can I tell you something? That even though we are in the world, we are not of the world. And even though they were in Egypt, they were not Egyptians. And so there was a final plague to come. And the Lord came down and he told Moses that, that there is coming, a, there's coming death to Egypt. There is going to be death is going to come and it is going to pass through Egypt. And the firstborn of every family will die. He said, I want you to take a lamb. And I want you to take the blood from the lamb and take the blood from the lamb and I want you to put it on the doorpost and the lintel. And when the angel of death sees the blood, he will pass over. And so I can just hear it in my mind. I can, uh, I can see it almost. As the angel of death began to sweep through Egypt like a sinister wind whistling through the streets, blowing through the cracks under the door, seeping through the broken panes of glass. In every home there was death. The firstborn, every firstborn's life was taken. This grievous wind blew through the poor district. It, that wind blew through the business district. It blew through the religious district. It went through the wealthy district. It got to the rulers house it went all the way to Pharaoh's house and there was a great cry in Egypt as death began to walk the streets of Egypt but that same wind made its way to Goshen and it began to blow I could just hear the windows rattle I could hear the door shake amen and as that death angel would approach the door as if to go in it would see the blood and it would pass over Amen. I can just imagine they could feel that pressure. They could see the darkness out the window. And as that dark cloud passed, you got to know how they felt. Amen. When the wind, that darkness, that spirit, that death passed over their house. Oh, amen. Where's Sally? Amen. Where's Joe? Where's Jacob? Where's Eli? And when they found the firstborn, oh, he spared my baby. He spared my son. He spared us. Everybody say Passover. And the Lord instituted, before it happened, an eternal uh, keeping, an eternal observance. He said, hey, this shall be an ordinance that is observed forever. Everybody say forever. And it was this observance of a sifting that was survived that the Lord was celebrating right before his personal sifting. You think about it, the Lord brought, brought the people of God out of Egypt. He brought them through the Red Sea. He brought them to Mount Sinai and gave them the ordinances and the covenants and the washings and the cleansings and, and the, the, the ways they could find remission of sins and way they could walk in peace with God. He gave them the priesthood. He gave them uh, the Ark of the Covenant. He gave them a, a plan of salvation for that day. What a glorious thing to happen that when the Lord brought them out of the sifting of Egypt and he brought them through the wilderness of struggle. Amen. Look at what God did for the people of God in the wilderness. What miracles that God did in the wilderness. He, he caused a rock to follow them and that rock had an ability to follow them and it wasn't just a rock that followed him but there was a river that came out of that rock that was so full and so plenteous in water that it watered four million people and their kids and their cattle and all that's a lot of water I was reminded we don't have a water fountain in here and I got to look in and I couldn't find any water bottles and that's just for a few people here can you imagine how much water it would take to bathe just all of us 
And everybody say, thank God for water. I'm glad we all took a bath. Thank you, Jesus. And they had a rock that followed them that had enough water that they could, they could do whatever they wanted to. It wasn't a water rationing. They had plenty of water. And every morning they would get up, they'd fl throw the, th the, the flap off their tent, and they'd look out, and all over the ground was this miraculous manifestation that they called it manna. They could pick it up. It was like wafers, and they would gather enough wafers for Johnny and Billy and Sue and, 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 and everybody. They'd put it in a, in, in a bucket, and they'd have enough to eat. They'd have enough manna for all day. And every day they throw the flap out. Well, there it is, manna. It started out as, what is this? And to the point, they probably said, huh, this again. Everybody say survival. survival. Manna, I would say to you, got old. Even though they're there every day. And the Lord gave them quail. I, I, I honestly, in my own southern mind, I believe it was chicken. <laughs> Amen, a wind would blow those chickens out there and they would have enough bread and meat every day every day everybody say survival. survival but you know what you know what's better than survival it's thriving but for 40 years they survived God took care of them the Bible says their shoes didn't wear out and their clothes didn't get old now that's pretty cool you know, it'd be great if your shoes never got old. But you know what? I don't like wearing the same pair of shoes for three years in a row. I don't like wearing the same pair of shoes for ten years in a row. Here are the people of God walking through the wilderness and they had the same pair of shoes and the same uh, uh, outfit for... Oh, my Lord, darling, don't you got another dress? Billy! All you got is one orange shirt? They had to get tired of looking at themselves and looking at each other, amen, while they were going through the sifting of the wilderness. But the Lord brought them into the promised land. The Lord parted the Red Sea and parted the Jordan River and the Bible says that they went into the promised land and little by little they received the promise. The manna wasn't there anymore. The quail wasn't there anymore. But they had milk and they had honey and they had grapes. They had all manner of things. Amen. They, they no longer had to have miracles of survival because they began to walk in the land of promise and the rules changed and God began to give them things that they did not build. God gave them houses to live in. They did not build. God gave them vineyards that they did not plant. God gave them wells they did not dig. God gave them cattle, amen, that they did not raise. God gave them full-grown promises that came to pass in a moment. The walls came down. Amen. The enemy was destroyed. In a day. And little by little. Everybody say little by little. Little by little. They had to fight. They had to march. They had to cooperate. They had to help each other. Amen. Everybody, you know, when one, one tribe got, to, got their promise and got their inheritance, they couldn't quit fighting. Judah could not quit fighting. When Judah had Judas, Judah had to keep on strapping on their sword and picking up their uh, shield until Naphtali got their promise, until Simeon got their promise, until uh, 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 Reuben got their promise. Amen. They could not quit fighting until all the tribes of Israel got theirs. There had to be an understanding that this isn't just the land of Judah. And this isn't just the land of Reuben. But this is the land of Israel. And amen, I may not be going through a fight, but you're going through a fight. So where's my sword? Where's my prayer shoes? Amen. Where's my shout and shawl? Amen. I and you and me and you, we're going to have victory because we're in this together. This isn't just my land. It's our land. Amen. 
Amen. You know, it wasn't just something that they got to live in. It wasn't a transient. It wasn't a temporary situation. But the Bible says that he put their name on it. They got the deed title. They set the stakes. They, they, they set up the landmarks. And they measured it out from here to there. And they had it all measured out where everybody was going to get to go before they got to go there. And the Lord brought the people of God out of Egypt, through the wilderness, into promise. Everybody say Passover. And for generations, the Jews in the land of promise, once a year sat down and they took the bread and they took the cup and they remembered where the Lord had brought them from. They remembered the miracles that God did for their fathers. They remembered where the Lord gave them the priesthood and where the Lord gave them the Ark of the Covenant and where the Lord gave them the tabernacle. And it was in this memorial session of remembering the Passover that the Lord began to deal with his disciples about things that were about to happen. And he said to them, one of you are going to betray me. Amen. Can I tell you, we all need a Judas. Jesus needed a Judas. Mm, think about that for a minute. Amen. One of the greatest things God gives us is a Judas. Because we can't kill ourselves. We can't betray ourselves. So the Lord has to give us somebody to help us die. Amen. You know what? The Lord had to give him someone to deny him. The Lord had to give him someone to choose between. And in the road, the path into which the greatest things that would ever be accomplished through the man Christ Jesus, there were some things that just had to happen. There had to be someone that would betray him. Jesus said, you know, it is necessary for this to happen. One of you are going to betray me. And he says, it's got to happen, but I feel sorry for you if you're the one. Woe unto you. And it is in that setting, in this intimate setting, where the Lord looks at Peter and says, Peter, the devil desires to sift you as wheat. Can I tell you, and I know you already know it, some of you thinking the preacher is preaching to me today. You know, when the Lord gave this to me, I woke up a little earlier than I had anticipated. <clears throat> I won't tell you what happened, uh, but I, I got a ding on my phone about 7.30 in the, the morning on, on, on sa Saturday morning. I won't say who did it, <clears throat> but she's probably thinking about it. I that was me. <clears throat> and, and I woke up. Thank you, Sister Beth. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you, Sister Beth. <clears throat> I, be I betrayed you. But as soon as I woke up, it's like the Lord dropped this in my heart beyond the sifting. And I began to think about from Peter's perspective. Peter is sitting there with his Lord. Peter is sitting there with the man in whom he had left everything to follow him. Here is the man in whom the Lord had given him a revelation that none of the other disciples had, that Jesus was not just a teacher, but Jesus was the Christ. Peter, who had a, a, such a boldness about him concerning the Lord, that when the Lord looked at him and said that Satan desires to sift me, amen, he felt like the Lord had, 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 had rebuked him in an unwarranted way. I didn't deserve that, Lord. Lord, I've been your loudest supporter, and you're telling me that I'm going to let you down, and I'm going to make you look bad. Amen, Lord. No, Lord, I'm willing to go to jail. I'm willing to die. And can you imagine how startling it was when the Lord looked at this sincere, fervent believer in Peter and he said, Peter, 
That this day is not going to be over. The, 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 the rooster will not crow three times. One time until you have told people you don't know me three times. you got to imagine how startling that was. I mean, how discouraging. You know, Jesus don't have any more faith in me than that. I mean, I've been following this guy around for three and a half years. When I could be out making money and I could be buying a new boat and I could be doing all kinds of other things and then he's telling me he, he doesn't have any more faith in me than that. Amen. A few hours pass. They go to the garden. The Lord asked him, why don't you pray with me for a little bit? I, I've got a burden. And, and he goes a little further and he prays. And, and he prays and he sweats as great drops of blood. And he comes back in his three, Peter, James, and John, his closest fellows, they're asleep. And he says, come on, guys. Can't you, can't you just pray one hour? Just, just one hour? And he says, keep on praying. And he goes out and he, he continues to pray the same thing. And he comes back and he finds them a second time. Oh, come on, fellas. Can't you just pray one hour? And he goes and he is in the trial of his life. The Lord is pressing upon, amen, the, 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 the demand upon that, that, that man, the demand on the man. When the man realized that the destiny in which he was born to fulfill, it wasn't to just sit on a throne, but there was a cross to be born. And he began to struggle and say, Lord, if it is possible, I don't want to go through this, Lord. God, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. The Lord comes back and he says, oh, sleep on, fellas. You know, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Pray that you enter not into temptation. And it's just about that time they hear the clanking of the boots and they, they hear the shuffle of the soldiers through the garden. And, and, and Judas approaches Jesus and embraces him and kisses him and the Lord says, are you going to betray me with a kiss? And they take Jesus away. And here is Peter and John, James. The disciples are there. And they watch as they, they take Jesus away. Peter is so exercised that he pulls out his sword and ready to fight. And it cuts off the ear of Malchus. And the Lord reaches out and takes the ear and puts it back and says, put your sword away. It's not time for that. Now, Peter probably felt, look at that. The Lord said, I was going to deny him. I was ready to fight. But I think that the seriousness of the situation changed a little bit. Jesus is taken to trial, and there's all kinds of things that are beginning to happen. And, and Peter is kind of following. He's, he's really concerned about the Lord. He, he's wondering what's going to happen. And, and he's, 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 they're building a the fire and he begins to warm himself almost as a spy. Amen. You know, I, I wonder what's happening. I wonder if there's an opportunity for me to help Jesus. And, he, and, and, and there's that atmosphere. You know that atmosphere where you, you know you're in the wrong place. And there's a bunch of... Have you ever felt like somebody would want to whoop you? Huh? Uh, have you ever felt like somebody could kill you? I've never felt that. But Peter was in a very hard spot. And someone says, I think I know you. You're one of Jesus' followers. And Peter says, you, you got the wrong guy. I don't know Jesus. A little bit later, another person asks him, and finally a third person, and he curses. And he says, I don't know who you're telling you. I don't know who, I don't know who Jesus is. And immediately, immediately. I don't know if the rooster slept late or where they got up early. But he was the first one. 
And as soon as that went off, Peter remembered. And he went out and began to be sorrowful. Everybody say sifting. And he began to endure what I would say is the longest three or four days that any person has ever lived through. The one that he had seen turn water into wine. The one he had seen feed the 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes. The one he had seen raise the dead. The one in whom he knew was the Christ. He had done in his mind worse than Judas. He had betrayed and done exactly what the Lord, what, exactly what he said he would never do. And can I tell you, we have all been there. And if we live long enough, we'll probably all be there again. There is a sifting that comes to our lives. There are times when we find ourselves in a place that we never dreamed we could ever be. Amen. You young people, you may have been living in your father's house and you may be uh, to a great degree doing things your father expects you and every one of us as young people went through a season of sifting and we probably all have some regrets and wish we would have done things a little bit different. Some of us may wish we would have done things a whole lot different and we look back and say, Lord, oh God, I wish I hadn't had to go through the sifting but can I tell you, Jesus looked at Peter and he did not say, I have prayed for you that you don't fail. He said, I have prayed for you that your faith fail you not. Because can I tell you, there are times when you will fail, but your faith is still there. Amen. Your faith must not fail you when you fail you. I have prayed for you that your faith Fail you not. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Amen. You know, as I considered this word, I began to, begin to write it out. Amen. And I, I have somewhere to preach tonight. And, 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 and I thought, of, I thought this, is, this is for there. And I'm typing it out. And, you know, the Lord's talking to my heart. And I, just meditating and studying. And as I, as I continue in the message, I, I begin to think of a specific individual that I know, a son of a, of a friend of mine. And, and I think, oh, this is for that person. And then I keep typing and I get to thinking about, this is for my church. This is for this church. This is for what you've been through. This is where we've been. We have been through a season of sifting. And I kept typing and I thought, this is for me. And at the end of the message, I got to the conclusion that this message is for everybody. Amen. We all go through seasons of sifting. And we all deal with the regret of how we wish we would have handled things differently. And we wish we would have done better. We wish we would have been more faithful. But here we are today and we are on the other side of the sifting. Amen. Imagine when Peter, amen, he got a message from the ladies and, and the, 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 the Lord said, the, the Lord said, the Lord said, he said, and, and tell Simon. That I'm alive. Amen. And Peter and John ran toward the tomb. And it was uh, uh, Peter that, that went into the tomb. And he saw those two angels standing at the foot and the head. Amen. And said, why are you looking for the dead among the living? And you read what happened in the next few chapters. And the next few moments until Pentecost. And you find where the Lord began to deal specifically with Peter. We know that Peter despaired. We know that Peter was discouraged. He even went and started fishing again. He thought, well, I can't, God can't use me because I, I denied him. I, God can't use me because I disappointed myself. I have not done what I should have done. But the Lord came and dealt it with him specifically about the very thing God had called him from. And the Lord gave him a personal plea 
three times. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. There aren't very many people in the Bible that can say that Jesus called them three times at the same place at the same time to do the thing he called them to do. The man that denied the Lord became the spokesman on the day of Pentecost. Why? Because there is something beyond the sifting. There is a purpose beyond the pain. There is a promise beyond the challenge. There is life beyond failure because God is not going to leave us in a season of the sifting. God is going to bring us beyond, beyond the sifting, beyond the sifting. God has a purpose beyond, beyond. It doesn't matter what you said. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the disappointment. Can I tell you that the presence and the spirit of God would say to every one of us today, I have something greater. I've got something greater than you have ever experienced before. I've got greater promises than you've ever seen before. But you got to be willing to leave the regret and step forward into a new day as Peter did. He survived the sifting. He thrived after the sifting. And he was used in a mighty way in the kingdom of God because he was able to get out of that place of, of regret. <laughs>